Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to uh, the Global Congress community. It's a pleasure to see you all and an honor. It's also an honor to be part of the uh, open air family. This is uh, my third day of conference, so there's a little bit of conference fatigue, but it's, uh, I know I will be energized uh, speaking to you in this wonderful uh, group. Um, Last year, I spoke to the Global Congress, and I spoke about what was then the current reality in Egypt, which is where I come from. Um, when I thought of what I speak about this year, when I was invited, I thought I will uh, talk about IP and the public interest from a developmental perspective. And if you will allow me, I will use the, the logic of the tensions of the debates that we talk about in IP in just providing a perspective on an interpretation, perhaps, on what is going on in my country. I just, it's hard for me to detach from all what's going on. So um, when we talk about intellectual property uh, in the framework of knowledge, technology, and development, uh, I'm reminded uh, by uh, how the information and communication technologies uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken to um, or, or used the interpretation that they take the markets, the global economy, and national economies a step closer to uh, perfect competition. The textbook definition of perfect competition, uh, in my uh, introductory economics course, we look at perfect competition, many buyers, many, sell many sellers, a perfect flow, perfect flow of information, um, lower barriers to entry. So to some extent, with the um, uh, vast developments in information communication technologies, we have seen this take place to the extent of uh, offering new opportunities for the small player thanks to the technologies and the uh, uh, foreign transactions costs. Uh, companies could concentrate on their core competency and uh, outsource parts of their operation uh, services, perhaps to the guy next door, or actually also to the guy halfway across the world. So in that, in that sense, it was an, uh, it's an empowering technology in that, among many other uh, examples, it is an empowering technology. It provides opportunity for the small player within a global market. Uh, but on the other hand, while we see this, uh, what I call uh, centrifugal forces away from the center, you know, providing uh, opportunities for players in the front parts, we also have at the same time, a concurrently, an opposite trend taking place at the same time. Thanks to the, what Yochai Benkler calls the quirky characteristics of knowledge, uh, to a great extent, we have also seen forces moving towards the center. We have seen the opposite direction. We have seen uh, the centripetal forces creating uh, large hierarchies, vertical hierarchies, built around the creation and the protection of uh, knowledge. I'm sure, uh, I, I, I don't mean to preach to the crowd, but I'm sure you all know that knowledge does have uh, the characteristics of a public good, being non-rival. So if I learn a theory, I have not taken it away from you, whereas if I eat my pizza, you cannot have it. Pizza is a private good. So, but I, when I learn a theory, uh, I, I, it's just out there for everybody to learn, in fact, some have argued that its value increases with the increase in the number of users. So um, one can also argue um, for a public good, uh, and the other characteristic is non-excludability. Of course, in the case of knowledge, we cannot make that argument comfortably because we know we can put barriers to knowledge. May these be economic, technological, and they exist. So the argument has been made uh, that knowledge can be considered a quasi-public good. In all of these, it does have quirky characteristics. And we cannot deal with knowledge just simply as we deal with the private good. So uh, looking at that, um, given it the public ca uh, good characteristics, the, cost of, the marginal cost of producing an extra uh, unit, an extra user, is zero. So optimally, you would price knowledge at the price of zero. But of course, who wants to produce a good that would be sold at the price of zero? So the market fails. And you have what is known as the access versus incentives tension or debate. Um, so uh, in the, within all of that, with the creation of the monopolies, then you have the static inefficiencies, and uh, which is, of course, not optimal. But you also have an argument for the dynamic efficiency or inefficiency. In some cases, maximum protection will go for uh, encouraging, uh, is argued to provide incentives for future production, but also if you take uh, the other argument uh, because of another quirky characteristic of knowledge as an input and an output at the same time, then it can block future innovations as well. 
So, uh, and also there is always the argument that uh, incentives for knowledge production can also be non-market incentives. So in all of this, I think my, my concern with this is this image where we have large, vertical, old hierarchies as opposed to um, the other alternative of flat or horizontal structures where uh, business models are created uh, thanks to uh, the technology and knowledge at the same time. Uh, I am reminded of uh, the excellent article by Adler actually earlier in this century where he, uh, Paul Adler, where he makes um, a very interesting argument of three modes of knowledge production and uh, three modes of production in general. There is the market regulated by price and there is um, a hierarchy regulated by authority and there is community regulated by trust. So you have these three blocks. And in talking about information and knowledge, Adler makes the excellent argument that you cannot deal with knowledge within a market mechanism, pure market mechanism, because then the price signal is not suitable. You cannot um, formulate a market supply demand curve like you would do for my pizza. And at the same time, the price signal will not be the optimal uh, allocating uh, mechanism. He also makes uh, the argument that's relevant to uh, my point that I will take later is that with hierarchies, information are likely to flow top down. So there's an opportunity cost of losing the information that can flow uh, bottom up, given the hierarchical structure of the authority command where um, you know, uh, information flows uh, mostly in one direction. Now, in his um, argument is that communities are the uh, optimal uh, forms of creating and disseminating knowledge, and communities are mitigated by trust. And this argument was made in 2001, which I find quite interesting, uh, having you know, such an, an early uh, perspective on matters. Uh, I'm reminded that when uh, these three modes do not have to be mutually exclusive, and I'm reminded of our scenarios at the open air uh, yesterday. We looked at different scenarios for the future, and we do not have to uh, have one and not the other. These three can exist at the same time. Now, going back to um, the public interest and um, the, the impact of uh, knowledge, you know, the debates, the tension between access and incentives. Clearly, uh, when you have, um, um, you know, monopolies and when you have um, impact of the maximal closure of knowledge, you are likely to have um, an impact on um, uh, public interest, but also on, on development. Development in its wider sense. Development as looked at by uh, early by Dudley Sears, for example, a development that has to incorporate employment, poverty, to, to deal with unemployment, poverty, and inequality. Ahmed mentioned just a while earlier jobs, and that's very important. I mean, this is an important, uh, um, this is a dimension to look at when we look at knowledge and uh, development. Again, the impact of this debate on knowledge and IP impacts development as, of course, as freedom, Amartya Sen's notion, and development as, uh, of course, the way, uh, as uh, discussed and analyzed by uh, Joe Stiglitz, which is way beyond just the mere growth in GDP figures, which is a very narrow way, of course, of defining um, development. So in looking at all of this, the impact of knowledge IP on, um, on the public interest, but also on development and human rights, the impact of these issues becomes harsher for developing countries in light of their uh, weaker institutions, uh, in light of their uh, less developed capacities, human capacity sometimes, negotiating capacity, litigation capacities. And an important point that's very relevant to Africa and, so, and Egypt and certainly for uh, all of Africa is that a good uh, deal of our knowledge um, is not formal. So we, we do not show favorably on formal statistics of metrics of measuring knowledge and innovation. So in a world where we are more users than producers of formal knowledge, this is not to say that we do not produce knowledge. We, we use, the for, as far as formal knowledge is concerned, we are uh, more users than producers of this patentable, you know, formal knowledge that fits the mold, then uh, we certainly need to have open doors for us to take in knowledge, which is an input for the production of this knowledge. So in all of this, in, in looking at these tensions, in looking at these images of different structures um, operating, I cannot help but think of what we have been going through in Egypt. Overall, not just on the IP, issues, but just the general paradigm that we have been living over the past three years, but also going a little bit more further uh, in history. We do have, we have been uh, having um, uh, regimes that have been strictly hierarchical, old, rigid, uh, certainly dealing with command and authority uh, top-down 
authority. We have had uh, Mubarak for, uh, good, for a good or bad 30 years. And uh, we, that was followed by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces for another year and a half almost. And then we had another hierarchical structure with the Muslim Brotherhood. And now we have, um, uh, you know, you, you of course you know uh, that uh, people came out in uh, June uh, 30, 2013. And what we now have is a transition period where we have um, a president who is not from the military, but we also have uh, uh, some, you know, uh, some control by the military, and we do have a civilian government that is backed by the military. Um, in, while we have those rigid structures that are opposing to change, and Ahmed mentioned change, and this is crucial here, you've had the opposite trend, exactly the opposite trend happening ground up. You have had these communities uh, cemented by trust, for sure, people coming together, protesting, either just in uh, protesting on the streets, but we've also had several movements from civil society, so uh, if we can look at this as formal organizations, but we've also had a lot of initiatives, informal initiatives from young people, from um, different members of the community, tremendous energy and tremendous uh, spirit that has come out since uh, January uh, 2011. Uh, for example, uh, we have had um, continuous um, uh, pressure from uh, the people from the community, from civil society, to reform the police, okay? So what has uh, the, the consecutive regimes since uh, 2011 have adamantly refused adopting these initiatives? And this is why, this is part of our suffering these days. This is part of the, the fact that we do have a police that has been a constant um, uh, thorn, if you will, in the regime. And it is ironic that the very same um, regime that refused its... Um, reform is actually uh, suffering from them as we speak. So it's ironic, like this is something that we have lived with and uh, the initiatives have come from the ground, from civil societies, from the people. You can think of this as new knowledge, new ideas, fresh ideas for change, but then it is adamantly refused and adamantly resisted by old uh, paradigms of re that are resistant to change and continuously adopting um, uh, old policies. And at the end of the day, really uh, not much has changed. Um, there have been initiatives also, uh, for example, no to military trials where heroic young people are uh, constantly um, protesting and um, looking for change. There have also been uh, positive, uh, there, I mean, there are uh, maybe uh, very few stories of success. There has been um, uh, uh, advocacy for uh, pushing for minimum wage adoption and that was accepted uh, by by the government. There also been a story that I am very proud of personally. Um, it's the uh, working with uh, f advocating for open source software. And this started with a piece of research that we did within the A2K um, uh, research uh, activities at the center. And we had uh, a book on A2K, uh, A2K in Egypt, where we have contributions uh, from actually Ahmed and uh, several of our uh, colleagues and researchers. And actually, we, we were calling for we're bringing to the fore the first research that has brought to the fore the concept of we need what role for open source software in the um, um, in the Egyptian uh, market in the ecosystem, and this has developed into uh, we have brought the community together, we have developed a civil society group advocacy mobilization at, at the level of the government, and we're finally having the, which is great the government the Ministry of Communication Information Technology asking us to draft this strategy. So uh, this is an example where there has been, I mean, it's a drop in the ocean, but there has been an initiative that actually made it, almost made it uh, to a completion to implementation. And on the other hand, there are tons of activities that have been doing people continuously pushing for change, for new ideas, for freedom of information, which is something else I have been involved with personally. But unfortunately, these are not really bringing uh, fruit and at the end of the day, I see this image of the rigidity of a hierarchical regime that is resistant to change, that will really continuously move top down and not accept initiatives coming from the ground. And we have also, I have to say that we have had a failure of our democratic, our democratic institutions are not yet developed. So uh, it is part of, of the difficulty that we are living these days is that we have not had enough, um, uh, we do not have developed parties, we do not have a voice. Even civil society who are, have been there for a long time and are working hard and st still struggling to establish 
pressure. I know we had this discussion last year uh, with Niva looking at the, uh, the role of the civil society. They're still working very hard, but there's a lot of resistance to change. So what, what do I take away from all of this? Just thinking of the discussions that we had over the past couple of years with open air and uh, what you know the discussions that I look forward to having over the next couple of days. One um, statement, one conclusion that Jeremy De Beer said yesterday and resonated with me is that we need to widen our perspective. We need to just take a step back and look at issues not from the, you know, don't look at the trees, but look at, at the, the forest. In the case of Egypt in particular, with all its suffering, with all the difficulties, we still have, we are in a transitionary period. I would not say that, um, January 25 per se was a revolution. It was the start of a revolution. The revolution is continuing and it is more of building a, a transition into democracy and that takes time and this is something for us to learn. This brings me to my second point. Actually it relates to what Toby said um, uh, earlier and said again today this morning. The one size fits all. We are uh, constantly um, assessed and analyzed the Egyptians and the experience of Egypt from a certain perspective. You know what? We are having an experience that we ourselves are trying to grapple with and understand. We do not want a, a metric to measure our, or to assess what we have done. We do not want labels. We do not want um, to, be, um, to be classified into a dictionary. Let's create our own dictionary. What we, just like with IP actually, um, we do not want to be uh, locked up in rigid constructs and be viewed from a narrow lens. We do not want a one-size-fits-all, a one metric to come and measure us. Perhaps we do not fare high on global metrics of democracy at this moment, but, this, but we don't fare high on, high on metrics of knowledge creation at, at, you know, at the same time. So we are having our own transition experience. We want a discourse that does not necessitate pre-programmed, pre-packaged logic. It's an innovative context, it's a narrative that we ourselves are trying to understand with all its suffering. It has actually, it has surpassed conventional definitions. It's the mainstream paradigms cannot serve to fathom such a novel undertaking. We ourselves are trying to understand and live through what has been taking place. So with all the pain, with all the suffering, just like with knowledge, IP and innovation, we need to develop our own dictionary with concepts that emanate from these constructs, from these distinctive narratives, and we've come out from our unique realities. Overall, I'm still optimistic. I was optimistic last year, and I'm still optimistic this year. Thank you very much.